Hi, this is Dr. Justin Marcajani, and today's talk's all about protein. There's a lot of hoopla on the news about protein. There's a couple different studies, a rat study, a couple different studies on, um, on elderly patients between 50 and 65, and 65 and off eating protein and cancer risk. We're going to break that down, try to you know separate fact from fiction. I'm going to give you my take on a couple things as well, and we'll also give you some application at the end. I try to not make things so uh, um, cookie cutter where it's, it's a one size fits all. There's definitely an individualized approach to it. So first things first, what is protein? Well, protein is nothing more than an amino acid. So what's an amino acid? Well, this is an amino acid. So you can see we have some carbons in it, we have some nitrogen, we have some hydrogens. And when we have you know, um, various plant proteins, we're going to have amino acids strung together. And with animal proteins, we'll have amino acids strung together as well. The difference with most animal proteins is animal proteins contain all 10 essential amino acids. So what essential means is essentially your body cannot make those amino acids. They have to take them in through outside sources. So a lot of plant foods, sometimes you have to combine rice and beans or lentils and such to get both amino acids from each. So methionine and lysine are two common deficient amino acids that are, um, that are found in plants. And those amino acids are really important for detoxification. They're also really important for carnitine. The carnitine shuttles how your body burns fat. So carnitine is an important compound made from amino acids. So a lot of good things come from protein. All of your neurotransmitters, such as serotonin, the feel-good, the happy neurochemical, that comes from tryptophan, commonly found in turkeys. Um, tyrosine or L-tyrosine is commonly found in, in um animal food and plant food as well, but that's an amino acid that converts to dopamine. So all of these amino acids become your neurotransmitters. Um, even the endorphin compound known as beta endorphin, which is a natural antidepressant, comes from 19 different amino acids. So every single chemical in your body, neurochemical-wise, and even hormones, they, they connect with cholesterol, they're all made from protein and essentially fat as well. Because typically in nature, you don't really get protein by itself. That's one of the biggest issues. For instance, if you're in colder climates and you are having to survive, let's say, on rabbits, there's a phenomenon known as rabbit starvation. And what that is is that the rabbits are so lean, they're so high in protein, and have so very, very little fat, you can literally starve to death, even though there's plenty of protein. And the reason why is that you actually need fat to actually help break down protein. Um, not getting too much protein and not enough fat can actually create deficiencies in fat-soluble nutrients. So protein is really important. The biggest issue is, well, what's the difference between protein in animals and protein in plants? Well, my conclusion is it's more or less the quality, right? So we're going to talk about that in the confounding variables down here. But most studies that we look at actually are observational studies. They're people filling out a questionnaire. And we're not really ever looking at the quality of the meat. How was it cooked? Was the, was the animal fed hormones and antibiotics? And did the animal eat GMO feed? Was the meat burned? Did it create heterocyclic amines or polyaromatic hydrocarbons? There's a lot of variables that we need to fret out and that can have a huge impact on, on what the research is saying. So I'm going to differentiate that. But again, protein is important. It becomes our muscle. It helps stabilize blood sugar. It helps provide neurochemical support. And also, protein is really important because it keeps our, our sweet cravings down. It keeps our blood sugar stable. So if we're eating protein and fat together, like we normally do in nature, we're going to be okay most of the time. Now, some people's protein requirements may be lower because they're less active. Some may be more. So we'll talk about the different recommendations. I, I go between about 0.5 grams to 1 gram per pound of body weight. I'm a little bit more on the higher side, but the more active you are, in my opinion, you need protein. Also, detoxification. Protein is needed to run these different pathways called N acetylation, uh, methylation, oxidation, all these different pathways that help produce glutathione and help get toxins to make them water soluble and excrete them to the body are all used primarily with amino acids as, as the primary compound, right? Glutathione is made from glycine, cysteine, and glutamine, right? This is our master antioxidant. So in my opinion, I think protein from whole food sources is good, and we'll kind of wrap up with that. But research-wise, Journal of Cellular Metabolism, March 2014, Levine et al., they came out with research showing that People that were between 50 and 65 years old, decreased protein actually caused decreased cancer. And people that were 65 and up actually 
eating more protein actually helped them decrease the risk of cancer and all-cause mortality. So when you're younger, it seemed like, well, the protein was bad. And when you're older, it seemed like the protein was good. So why is that? Like, is there like a, a, a switch that literally flips when you're 65 and it causes changes in how you metabolize and digest protein? I personally don't think so. I think there are some confounding variables, right? When you're doing observational research, it's not like a clinical trial where I'm feeding people in a laboratory, right? So we can't control what they're eating. A lot of this was NHANES data, meaning it was written down. People would recall it and they'd fill out a survey and they'd check it off. And if you checked off a uh, hot dog, well, hot dog also has a bun, which is a whole bunch of sugar and gluten in it. Well, that would come in the category as protein. Or maybe if you had a pizza with some pepperoni on it, well, that would go in the category as protein too. You're seeing the whole commonality here. There's a lot of refined carbohydrate and junk and gluten going into what those proteins are considered as protein. Not to mention the average person in this group actually ate 51% carbohydrate. So their diet was 51% carbs. And carbs eventually break down to sugar. We have some good carbs in the form of vegetables that are lower in sugar and higher in nutrients. But most of the carbs people eat are higher in sugar and less in nutrients. So this is a real powerful confounding variable most people aren't talking about. And not to mention, how is the animal meat cooked? Um, what was the quality of it? Organic, pasture-fed, grass-fed. Like, tell me all those things. I want more information. But again, this study can only give us the motivation to now create a study that's a clinical-based study where we're having people in the laboratory setting and we can actually feed them accordingly. This study cannot prove any causation at all. It's just correlation. It's, oh, that's an interesting thought. Now we have to do a study and actually produce cause and effect with it. So we can derive absolutely no conclusion. So anyone that says, well, because of this study, you have to do this, it's, it's totally incorrect. This is an observational study. There was a rat component to the study where they found higher protein increased cancer. But remember, rats and animals are two different things. Uh, Dr. Anishkoff's work in the 1930s on cholesterol found that rabbits or um, guinea pigs, I think it was rabbits, who ate cholesterol, it totally clogged their arteries. Well, why? Because rabbits are natural herbivores. Right? So we have to look at the, the uh, biogenetical uh, diversity of, of what we're looking at here. If we're looking at an animal or, or a, um, a human, we have to be able to compare. Does that really make sense? So I kind of want to dismiss that. Again, the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition did a study. They were looking at macronutrients over the last 30 years. Proteins actually dropped about 3 to 4%, surprisingly, which is interesting. And then also in the JAMA, the A to Z study, Christopher Gardner did a study where he looked at the Zone diet, the Atkins diet, the Learn diet, and I think the, the typical um, food pyramid diet. And what they found was on the Atkins diet, I'm not a proponent of the Atkins, but it is higher in protein. It's actually higher in fat than protein. But most people associate Atkins as high protein. It's really not. It's really high fat, moderate protein. But what Gardner actually concluded, and Gardner's actually a vegetarian and vegan on, on his own admission, he actually found improvements in virtually all metabolic markers. So what that means is lower triglycerides, higher HDL, uh, lower weight uh, circumference, uh, higher compliance, um, better waist-hip ratio. So markers across the board were significantly improved. And that was actually a trial where patients were put on these diets. So it wasn't a metabolic board study, but they were at least guided in the right direction and given support of how to conduct the diet. They did the diet in their own home, and they came back at certain points to weigh and measure over about a year and a half period. So we're getting good results there. So I think there are some confounding variables up here in some of these studies that aren't quite being fretted out yet. And also genetic individuality. This is really important. Old food doesn't cause new diseases. Food has been around for hundreds of thousands of years. They don't create new diseases. There are variables within them that are really causing the problem like the refined sugar, um, the hormones, right? We look at Weston A. Price in his book, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration. He found tribes eating lower amounts of protein and fat and tribes eating higher amounts of protein and fat all throughout the country, whether it was Pacific Islanders or the Inuit. And he found robust health in nearly all of them. He did say he found more robust health in the people that ate the animal products over the pure vegetarians. He also found that when tribes had access to animals, they always ate the animals. It was very rare a tribe was vegetarian by choice. It was usually vegetarian by necessity, which was a really interesting observation because Price was a vegetarian going into that study. And that was a 10-year uh, observational study into the actual environments over that decade. So it provides very useful data. We have no other research like that um, in our time. 
So I think eat old, eat the way our ancestors did. Eat old food, right? Not moldy food, but eat the way our ancestors did. Um, real food, right? Grass-fed meat, good quality lamb, beef, fish. Figure out how much protein you need. My typical recommendations are about 0.5 to 1 gram per pound of body weight. If you're more active, then you can do a little bit more. If you're more stressed, right, you burn to those neurochemicals, right? Amino acids make your neurochemicals. If you're having problems with sleep, well, melatonin's an amino acid too. So figure out what your needs are. Start with your, your carbohydrate and vegetable side and then have your protein and fat side and kind of seesaw and go back and forth and see what fuel mixture you, um, you survive best on. And remember, grains and refined sugar were never, you know, eaten, you know, throughout most of our generations as old foods. Certain types of grains that were sprouted and um, not quite the grains that we see today um, if you read Dr. Davis's book, Wheat Belly. But I hope you enjoyed this talk and you have a new perspective on protein. For more information, feel free and check the spot below the video on how to get a hold of myself, my website, and my YouTube channel. Thanks. Dr. Justin signing off. Have a good night.